Namaste and greetings. I, GBAT, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Nidhi, Anusandan Sanstan, Nayi Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag Web Policy Talks. Today, we are gathered for a special talk on urban water, food and waste cycling, and socioeconomic equity by Sushani Iyer as a part of the State of Cities hashtag City Conversations. This event is organized by IMPRI, Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies, and IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi. Now, let me take this moment to introduce the gathering. We are pleased to have with us today, as the chair of today's session, Professor Shyamala Mani, retired professor, National Institute of Urban Affairs, New Delhi. She is also the senior advisor at the Center for Environmental Health, Public Health Foundation of India, Gurugram. We welcome you, ma'am. Our esteemed speaker for today is Suhasni Ayer. She's an architect, urban planner, and the co-founder of the Audible Center for Scientific Research, CSR, a collaborative organization with multiple agents and agencies working around applied research in sustainable settlement planning, solar passive architecture, appropriate building materials and technologies, water and waste management, and renewable energy. She, is also, she also heads the Auroville Design Consultant, a planning and architectural design studio, primarily focused on planning, designing, and implementing the applied research development and projects within Auroville to field test the innovations and research carried by CSR and other organizations within Auroville. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. We are honored to be joined by Dr. Fausia Tarulum as a discussant. She's an assistant professor at the Department of Regional Water Studies, Terry School of Advanced Studies, New Delhi. We welcome you, ma'am. Now, yeah. now, I invite our chair, Professor Shyamala Mani, to initiate the discussion with her opening remarks and then proceed with the talk by our speaker, Suhasini Ayer. We look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'm very thankful to Impri, uh, Dr. Arjun, Dr. Simi, and um, all of you from Impri for giving me this opportunity to uh, open the discussion today on this very important topic uh, on urban uh, water, food, and uh, waste recycling. Um, I'm really uh, delighted that um, Sohasini, Dr. Sohasini Ayer and also Dr. Fozia uh, uh, are with us, and they will be also uh, contributing substantially to this discussion. I just want to make a few opening remarks uh, saying that, um, uh, which is of course uh, very evident, uh, the fact that uh, uh, water is of course uh, an extremely important resource, uh, not only in urban areas, but also in rural areas and wherever. And uh, it has become uh, even more important in this uh, COVID times, because uh, as I'm working in the health sector, um, you know, one of the important uh, uh, resources that, are, that is required for even just washing your hands uh, ever so many times uh, during the day, which is the requirement for COVID-19 protocol, uh, you require water. And um, uh, the uh, biggest issue when um, uh, we have been, we all work in the urban sector, is the um, uh, non-availability of uh, water or lack of access to water in, uh, especially in the economically weaker sections in the slums and uh, in, um, uh, several parts of our country, even in uh, fairly well-to-do colonies. Uh, and even if the water is available, the quality of water is extremely poor. The Central Pollution Control Board has declared uh, almost uh, over 100 uh, rivers as contaminated. And uh, we all know uh, for a fact that uh, more than 30 to 40 percent of the water from urban areas, especially uh, from uh, you know, contaminated with sewage and uh, chemicals 
are entering our rivers uh, without uh, proper treatment. Uh, and uh, in terms of um, groundwater, also we know very well that um, there has been over exploitation of uh, uh, groundwater in many areas, uh, people going beyond uh, what is sustainable water recharge and uh, which is creating uh, extreme hardships, especially for those uh, who uh, already have a lack of access to water and uh, who have to pay. So actually uh, there might be a situation where you and I uh, pay a reasonably less amount to the, our own uh, uh, water boards uh, while your maids and my maids might be paying um, you know, five times more for the same quantity of water and uh, they also don't know what the quality of that water is. And uh, coming to uh, food, uh, we know very well that uh, uh, even though the, uh, we, they say that we have 219% more, uh, you know, the FCI has in its go down, but we still have um, a lack of uh, access to food uh, in uh, several parts of our country. And uh, even in rural areas where, the, where they're growing the food uh, there itself, we find um, uh, even calorific nutrition, uh, nutritional deficiency, not just protein uh, deficiency, but even uh, access, uh, you know, re reduced uh, access to um, you know, grains and uh, millets and uh, several things like that. So, uh, and, but when you come to urban areas, uh, it is uh, believed that it has been estimated quite uh, strongly that the food wastage is nearly 20%. And uh, which is uh, very, very high. And uh, one cannot understand, uh, you know, why anybody would uh, want to waste food, but this is also because of overconsumption. Uh, or rather, uh, I would not say just overconsumption, but it is the uh, lack of uh, sensitivity towards, uh, uh, you know, who needs food and how much food is required, like you know, weddings and parties and various other types of celebrations where food wastage is extremely uh, high and uh, it, does not, it doesn't reach the people who actually require it. Although there are many organizations which are trying to redistribute uh, this food. In terms of waste recycling, I have been working for several years in this particular field. And um, I mean, one can go on and on and on about, you know, what are the types of uh, waste stage reduction, uh, as well as waste uh, recycling in terms of uh, uh, whether it's the municipal garbage or uh, biomedical waste or now the electronic waste issues and battery waste issues and uh, the newer things like hazardous waste um, or, uh, you know, um, uh, plastic waste, which has now become the talk of the town, so to say. Um, uh, so, uh, and all these have uh, particular uh, solutions. Uh, I have uh, had the good fortune to be in um, committees which have been set up by the government uh, because I have also done a lot of experimental work on the ground. Um, but uh, I find that uh, you know, even yesterday or day before yesterday when we went to do some monitoring in areas, we find that these rules are not really implemented. They are not understood and our own uh, people, uh, sorry to say some, maybe some NGO, some other people also, they know much more about, uh, you know, some international rules and laws and they don't pay as much attention to what has been passed in India and therefore pursue the government uh, to implement uh, the rules which are there in the country. Uh, of course, uh, these are all major issues and I'm sure uh, Dr. Swahasini will be discussing all these in great detail and uh, uh, without uh, taking too much time, um, uh, I would uh, welcome uh, her and Dr. Fazia and all other members who are attending this uh, webinar to tell us more about uh, these issues and their solutions. Thank you very much, Dr. Swahasini. Thank you, Dr. Mani. First, let me correct one thing. I have no doctorate. I'm just a simple architect and an urban planner. And for me, it's really an honor to have somebody like you actually opening the session because I have read some of your papers and I have heard about you. 
through some of the other people working at the National Institute of Urban Affairs when you were still working there. And I must say, thank you so much. When I this, uh, agreed to do, do this little session for IMPRI, I would have never guessed that I would meet you. And so for me, it is it makes my evening. Now to start with, I will screen share and kick off the, uh, my presentation, and we will take it from there. Okay, so I would like to thank IMPRI and all their members for having invited me. And I must say, in the beginning, I was very hesitant when I saw the, I've been uh, attending some of the talks that have been going on since the last few months, like Dr. K Mr. Katie Ravindran and other planners. And I did not really feel that I was on the same level to actually be one of the speakers. But I'm really glad I did this because during the process of organizing, I met very interesting people working in IMPRI and it gave me, I would say, a lot of hope to know that such, not just qualified people, but dedicated people were behind such organizations and building up awareness within the country. So I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to know you. Now I'm going to start with my presentation. So. Uh, yes, we can see it now. Yes. So I'm going to use Chennai as my case study to actually discuss the issue of water, food, waste cycling in our cities. And what I'm going to do is not actually make a presentation because I want to actually discuss it. I have a few things that I don't understand what is happening. And I'm going to use this opportunity to put out these questions to the organization and the organizers and the participants, like how the outputs of the cycles are impacting us during scarcities and disasters, which is when we actually come to think about them. At the same time, the efforts that the government, the NGOs, the citizens, the nonprofit organization have been putting in and addressing all the vicious cycle in urban areas in India, which is contributing to a lowered quality of life and the increasing economic disparity and social equity. And I would like to conclude the little presentation I have with some questions on what is perpetuating the status quo when all the actors and agencies involved want a situation to be otherwise, because whatever investigation I see, like from the politicians to the policy makers, to the planners and to the general public, there is a high level of dissatisfaction and awareness and a wish for things to be otherwise. So I would almost say like from the PM to the pavement dweller, people want a different, and why is it not being, why does the change not happen? So my talk is not really a talk, but an invite to the panel and the participants to share their views on what I call the paradox of urban India. Okay, why is it not? Okay, I have to use the mouse. So if you look at the map on your left-hand side, and this gives you actually the evolution in terms of size and location of the water bodies in the city of Chennai. Now, Chennai is the fourth largest metropolitan area in India, about 8.3 million population. The projected water demand is almost 2,250 million liters. And the deficit is 713. And the sewage generated is only 550. So now the sewage generated is less than the projected deficit, but the sewage treatment capacity of the city is only 114 million liters. So if I just look at these figures, there is obviously no rational connection between one figure and another. That means there are gaps, a huge number of gaps in this. So then I look at the groundwater quality and the levels, because Chennai's is quite a paradox. If I look at the main areas of Chennai, the sandy areas, which is 
all the washermen pets, Georgetown, Manali, Poru, Basnet. The water level is actually at six meters post-monsoon, no, pre-monsoon. So it is not, it's a lower level. In the clay area, it is about five and a half to six meters. And in the rocky area, which is towards the su southern part, it's six and a half meters. So Chennai actually sits on a water table that is pretty high. So what is it that makes the projected deficit happen? Okay. Yeah. Now, if I go a little further and I look at the built up area land cover between 1997, 2006 and 2016 on the map on your left hand side. And you see how the land cover is changed between 97 and 2016, which is just two decades. And you look at the natural drainage pattern, water bodies and the municipal cooperation boundary. The boundary keeps growing while the water body keeps shrinking and the natural drainage keeps getting impacted. Now the natural drainage pattern of Chennai, the impact on it, whether it is planned disaster or market driven development, when you see who pays for it, Chennai has had between 2010 and today, three major floodings, especially 2014-15 and the areas that were flooded and the kind of resources that, uh, you know, that between loss of work days, loss of assets and property, cost to the health and other things, who was paying for it? It is the citizens and the government. It was not just the low, uh, people in slums and low lying areas. I mean, the airport was flooded, which cost a lot to other people. But at the same time, what I see from the maps between Chennai 1980 to Chennai 2010, which is 30 years, if you look at the comparison between water body and built up area, and it's kind of amazing because it seems that the hydrogeo hydrological system of Chennai keeps getting smaller. The marshland, which are the wetlands, which feed into the groundwater table, which also filters the rainwater by holding it in wetland, the sponge effect. It's slowly getting eaten away, affecting the groundwater quality of Chennai. So Palikarni Marsh, which is a used to be a beautiful area of 7,000 hectares and 50, or 50 square kilometers today is 173 hectares and it's a huge difference in terms of it 80 hectares are presently being used as dump sites and dump sites not of not of segregated waste it's a dump site of unsegregated waste which the leachate is adding to the poor to the water pollution in 1986 government had identified this as one of the 94 wetlands under national wetland conservation and management program. And Tamil Nadu declared the Palikarni marshlands as a forest area. And yet, even today, it is the main dump site of Chennai city. So what is it? So the government is doing its best in terms of legislation, policy makers are working to build up the rules and regulation, how it gets, but the marshland keeps shrinking all the time. And yet, at the same time, there are new projects which are being set up. In north of Chennai, a sponge park is being set up, an artificial sponge park at a huge cost in Kargil Nagar, in Manali zone, where it will be a man-made wetland, which will replicate all the features of a natural pond system and its ecosystem. It is kind of paradoxical we are spending money in the north of Chennai to spare, set up something which is naturally available just 40 kilometers south of Chennai, which is being used as a landfill. And how does one decision and the other decisions sit together 
with the decision makers. And this, if you talk to them and you see how they're dealing with it, there are forces and pressures that are acting in terms of recreating marshlands and but at the same time project proposals that go out to imitate like sponge cities are being made in china and in other places so we are making a sponge park in chennai when a natural sponge park is available and that is not being taken into account and the two two or three rivers that flow through chennai over the years have become dump sites settlements slum settlements to the point that we have concerns of health and we have seen that post covid also and pre covid where we are looking at the number of households steadily increasing in these zones the kind of you know settlements that are coming in and regular dumping not by the people living in slums but actually by the city in river beds in the, within the city this creates a paradox for me because i'm thinking like between smart city program and singara chennai and other program we're talking about beautification quality of life you know clean in a clean rivers and other things but on the other hand there is no grassroots level change that is happening with enabling people to take decisions in their own hands and participate in actually reviving their cities there are large programs but very little of it actually filters down into hands of a participatory organization that enables and builds awareness for people to take care of their own cities so if you even look at the slums now we've talked about water but water is very much connected to slums and as the shamila talked about before if you look at the quality and availability of water and what it costs people in the lower strata of economic strata look at the map on your right hand side this is the map of slum population within the metropolitan limits of chennai and the percentage of people living in these various zones as compared to the total population in each zones of living in unorganized shelters or what we call slums and it is not something that we can hide away from anybody who is using the roads of chennai can see these slums you see the kind of services that the slums provide and all the unorganized sector in livelihood that happens because of these people so if you just look at it in 71 there were 1200 declared slums in chennai in 85 17 more were added and 235 non tenable slums but presently if you ask no new slums have been created since 1985 but it's not true on the land we can see constantly in low lying areas undeveloped lands lands that are actually set aside for open spaces and green areas are slowly getting these unauthorized structures because these people are providing a huge amount of labor services to the city of chennai and during the first wave of covid we saw the migrant labor from these slums actually moving because they had no more services to food and water and energy and this is the progression of change of land use in chennai from 1990 in 88 to 2017 if you look at open spaces water bodies very urban areas and barren land the barren land is getting built over and slowly as the barren lands and vegetated lands are getting built over the entire water cycle of chennai is getting disrupted disrupted that means between the groundwater wetlands and the 
water harvesting structures like Red Hills and others that provide water for Chennai are slowly shrinking because the watersheds are impacted. The water resource consumption is increasing with the built up area. So in a way, it's kind of amazing dissonance as the population and the land use keeps changing, the main resource that you depend on for an urban development, which is water, keeps shrinking. The watersheds are impacted. So the catchment areas are reducing further and further. And we start to rely on technologies like desalination to provide for the deficit water at huge capital industry investment costs and very little investment in local area development. Now, I looked at the various projects over the last 25 years that went into urban infrastructure and governance for water infrastructure in Chennai. Now we have under the JNURM, city of Chennai got 3,500 crores and 40% of it went into stormwater drainage projects. Stormwater drainage projects are often mixed in with sewerage projects. That means good quality rainwater is actually getting diluted with sewage. And then this mixed polluted water is drained into the sea, impacting the water quality of the sea and the biodiversity along the coast of Chennai and further down all the way to Rameshwaram and to Tikorin. And 860 crores went in for sewerage, but actually throughout the project uh, period of JNURM, was there a marked improvement in terms of flood prevention? No. Was there an improvement in terms of sewerage? No. So where does this investment go in? How did it impact the quality of life of people? Coming into the smart city mission, I looked at the various projects under smart city, restoration of water bodies. Yes, it was part of smart city, work, work completed, zero amount of money was spent. Restoration of temple tanks was part of the smart city. No work is completed, but actually money spent was zero. Augmentation of existing water network, phase two construction of missing link of sewage drainage, nothing was spent. Work was completed, nothing was spent. Stormwater drainage, nothing was done. And then missing link between various locations, stormwater drainage, there 44 crores was done. And this was done post the 2014 so, uh, city flooding. So all these projects were in the pipeline and some of them actually show work completed. But when you go and look at the budgets of what was released, what has been spent. So either city of Chennai has been advancing the money and the money has not come from the center or something, but inside the public domain, you do not find actually the financial information that matches with the project completion. And there, there are questions to be asked here. And I'm asking like who and where are, is the information available to a citizen? Now, taking into account who are the agencies and actors involved in water and sanitation, there's government ha agencies handling the three main agencies, Chennai Corporation, Tamil Nadu Water Supply and Drainage Board, and Chennai Metro Water Supply and Sewerage Board. There are several act citizens action groups and NGOs who are primarily working in water and sanitation and there are 19 listed organizations on the website. There are multiple resident welfare associations. They're not listed. CMA has says there are many, but most residential settlements do have a re residential welfare association. And one of the things as per the law is to look at water and sewerage. So it's not like there's a lack of agencies and actors, and it's not like there's a lack of programs and projects, and there's no lack of policies and you know, a push from the government. So, but there is obviously huge gaps and challenges because change is not happening. Now, moving on to the next part, which is food. 
with the help of this urban design collective, I got the information on where does the food come into Chennai. And if you look at it between Nagpur and Virudhunagar and Iduki, we are talking about distances which are ranging from 700, 800 kilometers away to 200 kilometers. And so before COVID, if you look at where the food came in and how it reaches the consumer from the Coimbedu wholesale market and private warehouses, you have several consumers who are between home delivery, direct sales, retail sales, the food is going. And I'm not even going to talk about quality of food or the quantity of food. I'm just looking at the food cycle of where does our food come in and how is it distributed? And if you look at it, Coimbedu is Asia's largest wholesale vegetable market. Okay, Every day, about 3,000 tons of produce reaches there. And like Dr. Shamla said, a large percentage, if you look at it from almost 3,000, 110, uh, and it's actually even more now, is going as waste on delivery. So, which is amazing because it's uh, spread over 65 acres, it has all kinds of wholesale markets, and 200, uh, 200 tons of garbage is generated every day, you know. And this is actually impacting not just the food producers and the residents of Chennai, it's actually impacting the very nutrient cycle of the country. Every waste that is dumped in the Coimbra market does, is actually a resource in terms of nutrients when it's composted and goes back into the fields where food is produced. But actually because of the distance between the producers and the consumers and the way it is transported, it's transported at least minimum 250 kilometers per hour, which is five hours between the producer and the collection center and the wholesale market. So among the perishable, between handling, dispatching and collection and distribution, one tenth of it is going waste and this waste never reaches back to the farms but actually becomes part of the city's waste, which then ends up in the low-lying areas, creating an issue in terms of pollution of our water table. And actually increasing the expenditure in terms of the city's budget in collecting the waste, transporting it, and managing it. So, well, Perunguri is get, have, uh, dealing with the waste that comes in from the food that is coming into Chennai and Palikarni marshes. And Chennai is one of the cities that is generating quite a lot of waste per kilos. If you look at it in the per capita waste levels, Chennai stands quite high compared to other cities as kilos per person per day. So there is something wrong in the entire cycle of uh, from the producer to the consumer in the way food handled on a metropolitan level for the city of Chennai. And this, I would say very safely, is a story that is played out in most cities of, in India, which is quite interesting because I was brought up in Delhi and during my childhood, a lot of the perishable was produced along the riverbeds of, Chen of Yamuna, where there was a kind of collective leasing to food growers who would then send back the produce into the local markets of Delhi and collect the, the perishable waste that was recycled into nutrient cycle for producing. As development happens, land use changes, floodplains, wetlands, which were food producing areas within urban areas, are slowly turning into developed areas and our food comes from further and further away, breaking the nutrient cycle and act actually adding to the city's waste management expenditure. And this is something that 
resilient city program of Chennai is looking at in terms of its, you know, food growing in the city. So I looked at the waste, a food and waste cycle inside Chennai, government agencies for food supply in Chennai, between FSSI, Food Corporation India, the ration shops, there are citizen action groups and NGOs specifically working in food in Chennai, 18 listed on the web, organizations working in urban food growing in Chennai, including the City Resilience Program, Chennai Resilience City Program, government agencies involved in urban waste, there are four of them, and citizen action groups and NGOs listed as working in waste in Chennai, and there are eight of them. Okay, so it's not for the lack of agencies. So what is happening between the politicians, policymakers, planners, and the people of a city in all levels of involvement, whether it's government, citizen, uh, you know, NGOs, citizen action groups, and the citizen, there is policies and programs, there are programs and capacity building, there are informed and demanding citizens them, with, through the media are getting the information out. There are projects of funding, there's funding and implementation programs, there's actually even step-by-step -step programs that help to set up implementation agencies and then the engaging actors in the field. And yet somewhere, between the three agent, uh, three actors, which is the citizens, NGOs, and the government, when I overlap it, and I say, okay, between the government and the citizens, the output should be that there's a cooperation of agencies and actors. That means there should be decentralized investment. If there is an ideal situation between the citizens and the government, there would be decentralized investment. Every management of public utilities you know, that is decentralized, so that's people's participation. There should be on-site recycling of waste, revitalization of open space spaces with bioswales, water harvesting. And all this would actually create meaningful employment with livelihood programs, skill development, and would, act, would allow for social engagement of people within their neighborhoods and their areas with the government and the citizens. But this is not happening. And if you look at the other over, over, overlap, which is citizens with NGOs and private sector and media, the citizens, this overlap would have innovations. The private sector with their CSR programs are seeding quite a bit of innovations. They're doing angel funding. They're doing you know, capital investment, public-private partnership. Their start, seed up is there. The NGOs are doing active engagement and cross pollination between the political, economic, gender, generation, faith, belief, building capacity. And finally, coming between the NGO, private sector, media, and the government, there are in multiple policies, programs, and projects to enable action programs. But in actuality, not just in Chennai, but cities of India, the urban systems are failing. And this failure is reflected in increasing disparity. In the mid nineties, the kind of population of people living in unorganized settlements to organized settlements, this disparity was slowly getting falling. But now since the last 10 years, it is back to the level of the disparity that was there in the 80s, which is why we went in for uh, political reform, which brought in the market economy. And this disparity is actually very important to look at because the more the disparity, more insecure our cities become, more the quality of life dro drops, more violence and exploitation, is happening between the haves who seek more barriers from the have-nots. But one thing that has become apparent during the last one and a half years with COVID-19 is that there's no barriers when it comes to certain kinds of disasters. We have seen, with, whether it's with floods or with COVID-19, at one point, 
no amount of economic or political barriers are going to separate the fallout between the haves and have nots. And I would really like to understand why is it, in spite of all these programs, like I read on 25th of August, which is just two weeks ago, Chennai is coming, reviving the Singara Ch Chennai, which means actually beautiful Chennai. Okay. And it has different projects. They want to have posters and litter, by mining of the different sites, converting them back into green spaces, water tapping, sewerage connection. They want to promote a healthy lifestyle, non-motorized transport, pavements again, so that people and elderly have again access to cities, which is not there anymore. If you're below 10 and above 70, city, city, dweller, city dwelling is not possible for you. When you look at all these different things, an upgrade to ex is expected to improve the civic infrastructure that in places that were severely flooded during monsoon. But we are going to be having our monsoon starting in another one and a half months in the east coast of India. And I wait to see if actually it's going to be different this year. And this is the end of my little presentation. Actually, not a presentation, I, a question to all of you. I would like to thank a few people who helped me with information, which is Krishna Mohan, who is the Chief Resilience Officer of Chennai, Vidya Mohan Kumar, working, who is the founder and principal of Urban Design Collective and wonderful organization doing great work in Chennai. Mr. Anantu, who runs a health and livelihood and nature program in Chennai, doing a lot of work. And a lot of Chennaites that over the last two decades I have been talking to and finding out how their lives are converging with the development of the city of Chennai and where are the points of conflict, where does it get combative, how are they participating or not participating to Chennai, and of course to IMPRI for inviting me to participate in this. Thank you. over to you thank you so much thank you yes ma'am very much uh, yes thank you interesting uh, talk and uh, uh, <laughs> it's really funny that i belong to chennai uh, lived uh, you know uh, did a bit of my schooling and college in chennai and now i live in delhi so swahasini so is exactly probably the reverse but uh, yes, but I could really relate because uh, I know all the places that you refer to. And I mm. totally agree that, uh, you know, it's in total disarray and the way the planning that is going on, not only in Chennai, but uh, like you rightly said, many of our urban areas are in a confused state of uh, implementation, despite the fact <clears throat> that we have had JNNURM and, uh, you know, Swachh Bharat and smart cities and Amrit and several other programs. So I now invite uh, Dr. Fazia Taranam. Uh, would you like to uh, introduce uh, her, uh, uh, Simi, or? Uh, uh, Dr. Fazia, would you like thank to- Thank you, I think, uh, I, I, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shamla. And uh, thanks to Hasni, I think very, very uh, pertinent questions that you have raised through your uh, through your presentation and uh, no straight answers. Really, none of us have any straight answer to this. But one thing, you know, uh, since you have questioned the status quo, and I always hold uh, citizens responsible for that a lot, and especially the middle class. I always say that most of these things perpetuate because of the apathy of the middle class. You know, we, we sort of, uh, we have, we bring democratically elected leaders and then we don't question them. We, we are content with the status quo. And here I would like to bring in, you know, Chennai, I think you gave an amazing example of Chennai. Chennai was like, um, you know, that 80-20 uh, ratio. So it was 80% blue green and 20% concrete in 1980s. And today, if you see the whole ratio has reversed. And I think very beautifully, you brought it out through your presentation as well, that how this has been reversed. The Adyar airport that we talk about, 
uh, is uh, or the airport in Chennai is on the Adyar plane that is there. So we have tried to acquire a lot of flood planes in Chennai. Chennai also was one of the earliest cities which brought in the rainwater harvesting in the bylaws. So it was in the early 2000s. But Chennai is also the city which saw flooding in 2015 and a severe drought in 2019. So again, I would say that in 2000 uh, and a little later than that, you would see that there was a phase when the groundwater table had come up because people had consciously put rainwater harvesting and the water levels had come up. But again, again, I would say that because what Dr. Mani was also telling earlier that the economic instruments around water are just not right. The poor pay close to 100 per day and then the rich pay <laughs> maybe 200 to five in Delhi for 20,000 liters, we don't pay at all. Huh? So you can imagine oh. the situation. Oh, yes. Mm. Up to 20,000 liter in Delhi is free for us. So so I think uh, Chennai had... 20,000 per what? Per annum or per... Um, 20 per month. 20,000 liter per month. Uh, so per you, household. Per household, yeah. So you don't okay. pay. 135 LPCD is the calculation. One mm. per capita daily. Yeah. In okay. Into 30, yeah. Yes. So it is, it is uh, per month and uh, we don't pay at all for that. So only if you exceed that, you, you pay for your water. So that's, and then you have the urban slums, which actually, you know, a study in 2000 and, uh, 2013 brought out that they contribute to almost 7.5% of the GDP. So you can't mm. uh, really imagine cities without uh, uh, the slum dwellers, but they have no right to city. So they have no access to water. They buy water at a much higher rate. Uh, our domestic health actually, you know, they get water once a week and uh, literally they have to keep awake the whole night to get water. So these are the disparities which uh, probably you, you definitely brought out. Decision makers and policy makers, I would say there's a severe lack of accountability that is there. So people, are, people know that nobody is going to uh, question them if they don't deliver properly. Uh, we were doing a project in Gurgaon on urban flooding in uh, in the golf course road. So I would say it was the active citizen. I am Gurgaon was actually supporting us in this project. And they reached uh, out to us when the Gurgaon Metropolitan Development Authority was planning to make more concrete drains. So it was like a DPR of 250 crores was ready. And uh, when I am Gurgaon reached out to Terry School of Advanced Studies and they said that would you carry out a quick study that something like this of this magnitude is required and more concretization for just one or two episodes of rain? We can understand that rain because of climate change or what, whatever reason, rains have become very intense. Uh, you get a lot of rain in a very small duration of time. Cities are not equipped to really hold that rain, but still do we really need those? And uh, we, they gave us a small segment of the Gulf Coast Road. And when we actually carried out the study there, we realized that uh, there were lots of creeks which were coming from the Aravali towards Gurgaon. And if these water that was coming could be diverted into those creeks, uh, probably a lot of water that was landing up on the Gulf Coast Road could be arrested upstream itself. And very, I would say, very basic solution. Of course, the report is there on the Terry School of Advanced Studies website, but very basic, simple solutions is what we suggested. Uh, where it was, it was lowering of parks, or whether it was, it was to do with uh, uh, trenches or channelizing the water from the road to the to the creeks. And uh, there have been multiple episodes of rain while the other parts of Gurgaon got flooded. Uh, the, the Gulf Coast Road did not get flooded this time. And that was the outcome of it. But I would, I would really uh, compliment the uh, Gurgaon Metropolitan Development Authority Commissioner. So you were asking about the policy makers and the decision makers. You know, he literally stick his neck out and he went against everybody and he said let's let's give it a try let's mm. give it a try so that was something you know it was a risk uh, because they get transferred very fast very soon you know they, they're there for for maybe six months or maybe three months very for a very short duration but for him to take that decision was really bold and it worked so that's something it's there in the newspapers also so that's something you know i just wanted to share so sometimes you need active citizen groups who can regularly 
engage with the government, but at the same time also support the government in implementation plan. So multi-stakeholder, when we talk of it, should be it should be in true sense a multi-stakeholder arrangement. Is something uh, probably is very important. Uh, I, in fact, uh, last, just a couple of days ago, I was in Patna to do a talk for a PhD engineers, and I realized, you know, the the junior engineers they were saying that while this Jal Jeevan mission of 55 liters of water on tap is being promoted and aggressively being implemented across the country, there is not much attention being paid to the source sustainability. So there are places where the water has table and most of it is from the groundwater so the water table has fallen down to almost about like uh, 500 to 1000 feet and it becomes very difficult to supply so you don't get the right kind of pressure as well again a great point that you brought out was on food miles how much our food travels huh? mm. and 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 also uh, in terms of the food waste so post harvest waste in itself in india is roughly about i would say 30 35% and then in transit, it becomes a lot, and a lot of lot of it at the consumer level also gets wasted. In our mandis, we see so much of food that gets uh, wasted. So probably, and on the other side, we have the triple burden of malnutrition. So where you have underweight and you have stunting and wasting, and and then you also have urban areas also have instances of obesity and uh, and overweight as well. So we we are actually experiencing both. Again, we talk of reforms. If we are looking at reforms in waste management, uh, we need to definitely look at the rack picker community. It's, a, it's, a, it's an informal community, which probably, you know, like I know in Indore, when they actually moved to mechanized handling of waste, a lot of rack pickers who were there, they lost their economic uh, you know, source of income completely. So that's one sector which needs to be mainstreamed if we are looking at handling of waste. Now, lastly, just, just uh, I would like to also just put here that any reform that we are looking at or anything that we're looking at, we need to, even the smart cities that you spoke about, we need to now go for an integrated approach. If we continue working in silos, yeah, we are not yeah, going to land up anywhere. So thank you. With that, I'll stop here. And uh, again, Suhasni, a lot to learn from Chennai. In fact, what, what you shared. Uh, and uh, it was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. What I would like to uh, bring to the table is actually the whole, um, because you talked about this IAS officer who stuck his neck out, right? Now we are in a country where we have maybe a world-class system of administrators through the IAS system and other things. But I find that there is a certain gap in the kind of awareness that most of the administrators officers have because the kind of program of training and other things and maybe refresher courses, they are not very attuned to a different way of doing things. The problem that we face today with climate change is one thing, but the resource crunch and the impact of a style of development, which most people call it concrete kind of development, but it's also a centralized, hierarchical, non-participatory, quick fix solutions with this system of contracts where 80% of the tender is only the financial evaluation and only 20% is looking at innovation, technical and design aspect. It's a vicious cycle where we have trapped ourselves and it's not like it is imposed on us from outside. This is our policy, our country and our people. How come the most brilliant people of this country call themselves IAS officers, whether from the collector level or to the chief secretary level, are not enabled to look at the problem statement differently than just continuing to create a system of development with programs that is just Okay, we prepare a DPR, we just give it to a contractor and they will do it. And then the contractor goes, the administrator goes and the people stay there. The problem has not actually been solved. 
even during the process of solving the trench digging and the sewage pipe laying and the stormwater laying and you know the water system laying, it not only disrupts the people's life, it causes insecurity, it creates a lower level of quality. And at the end of the cycle, with climate change, with climate, uh, you know, I would say extreme climates, you're back not to zero, but to negative. You know, I have seen each time a neighborhood gets stormwater drains, it has not solved any problems. And, but isn't it time that our decision makers actually go through a system of education about decentralized planning, designing with nature, and a certain level of participation between the beneficiaries, the actors, agencies, and the decision makers. Because nothing is solved by just throwing more money and programs at a problem. We have seen that. And that's why I brought up the JNURM and the smart cities. Good intentions, but the same conventional methodology of problem solving. Maybe our problems will not go unless we solve them differently. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Kozia and uh, Dr. Ms. Hasmi for your reply and response. Um, uh, Dr. Arjun, what would you say? Can we take a few questions? That we, can somebody help me with? Uh, yes. Yes, well, why don't you go ahead? Sima? Yeah. Uh, there are three, four questions on the question. Yeah. Uh, uh, third world war will be fought over water issue. How yeah. much is it true? It's an anonymous attendee, but um, you're welcome to ask the question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, ma'am could take this question and then we can go ahead and uh, take other questions as well. Okay. I would say that uh, uh, Dr. Fauzia should answer this question because she is the <laughs> expert in water. I'm here to ask questions myself. I should put up my hand and say, maybe question push hai. <laughs> So, yeah, I really would invite Dr. Fauzia to answer this question. And we, this is a nice statement made out some two decades ago, but what, where does it leave us? This one-liner, does it actually kickstart some kind of action? Is she there? Uh, Ma'am just left. Okay. Oh, okay, sorry. We can okay. Go next couple of questions, yeah. The, Dr. Mani, maybe you take it up? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, um, uh, you know, a third world war uh, may not be, uh, you know, one instance. I would say that it would be probably a continuum. <laughs> it's like uh, there will be, uh, wars fought over not only water, but several other resources. Look at our air quality, which is in bad shape. And, uh, you know, as we have said, you know, so many other resources, uh, even uh, energy or access to uh, food and uh, various other uh, resources are also in as bad a shape as uh, water. So uh, I think... Um, uh, the third world war may not be a single instance where some country is fighting with another country, but it's going to be probably a continuum over a few, uh, you know, this entire century when all of us are going to be struggling, as you rightly pointed out, uh, Suhasmi, that, uh, uh, you know, with the climate change adding to the dimension of uh, what is already, uh, you know, poor policy and implementation and uh, uh, you know, the kind of shortages uh, that we are facing. Uh, the uh, climate change is adding to all this and really making the, uh, especially the life of uh, the, the, you know, the lower economic strata even worse. Not that we are any better off, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, comparatively, I would say. So I, that's what my... Yeah, what I would say is that we even need to start looking at world wars differently, like we look at development differently. During the Second World War and the First World War, if you look at the number of countries or the population of countries that are involved, the impact on their lives, and compared to the world from the 70s to now, I would say stop thinking of world wars. The world is at war. There is 
a world at war which is involving more people, more countries, and having more impact in terms of people's lives and futures just in the last 10 years than both the world wars put together, statistically speaking. A lot of it might be translated in the media and in popular culture as having different reasons of fundamentalism, religion, and other things. But if you would go back to the root cause, it's more or less like Dr. Mani said, it's about resources and access to resources. Water is an essential resource for life and access to water, even our present last two years problem with China started with an issue of a dam, you know, and the fact that it might be impacting the flow of the Brahmaputra to a huge section of the population. And within the country, we have very combative situation politically and socially between states, like between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu over Kaveri. So let's have a change of mindset of thinking of wars as contained conflicts within a small zonal area and look at the world which is at war globally. And water is a major issue. Now sharing of water leads to a lot of conflicts, but there is a deeper conflict which is management of watersheds. We have brilliant people in this country who have not just on a technical level, but on a conceptual level that can translate into policies and programs on watershed management that would equally benefit rural and urban areas. It would benefit not just the present generation, but it would actually have an impact which is multi-generational. When you work from the watershed level, in terms of water planning, your entire urban planning takes a completely different color. And the socioeconomic impact of watershed planning creates a open space planning within cities that improves quality of life. And an improved quality of life actually will translate into better health, better security, <laughs> Yes. No, I think Hello. Was, yeah, no, that was uh, I think that just a small. Okay. Um, okay. And you... this is where I would like to answer to the person who brought this point is look at water as a very basis of urban planning and look at water as a very basis of uh, the political and social planning. And so then you will no longer actually consider yourself as middle class or economically weaker section or the rich because water ties us all together on a biological level that <laughs> cannot separate us, you know? And that's what I would keep saying, but let's train the decision makers to look at our resources differently than as just financial and technical means of implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Sohatsmi. There is uh, one more question. Um, it says that, um, you know, as we all know, the aftermath of development activities uh, from a neoliberal development paradigm that began uh, from 1980s onwards, though the notion of sustainable development was put, put forth as an alternative and correction to this paradigm, the case of Chennai, like other metropolitan cities in India, reveals that sustainability has never become a concern and vision of our everyday life even after 30 years. We need a cultural shift in terms of lifestyle, food habits, agriculture, construction, especially waste management, to which the governments and citizens have to take the responsibility. It looks more like a comment to me. Yes. <laughs> I would say yes. Whatever this person is saying, I absolutely agree with that person. I mean, the situation is much more complex than just the neoliberal economic policy and the market economy that we live in. And the consumption pattern has not just changed because we all suddenly decided to start consuming. It is a very deliberate policy, which is tied in into how economics and wealth is calculated. We look at GDP as the indicator of wealth. 
we look at GDP as an indicator of growth and development, which in itself is a very flawed concept. I mean, if you look at Tamil Nadu, the GDP went up quite high in the two years following the tsunami. But was it actually a good growth? No, it was not. A disaster leads to higher GDP growth. Like right now we are 20% something in the last quarter, but it was because of the depressed development and things like that. So I absolutely agree with this person on their statement, but going back to the core of what I had brought to the table is, I would like to know from the people who are commenting, where do you think we as people who are, have a little bit more understanding than the person on the road, can intervene in terms of understanding where is the crux of the problem so that we can frame the problem statement and our intervention has a better impact. And that is what I would like to address in our talk here is where do you think the problem lies? Can we frame that? Over to you. Thank you. Uh, there's uh, one question, uh, one more one more question which says, from your presentation that no money being spent on many of the components of water supply sewerage, uh, yet the state is shown as complete. Was the physical oblique structural verification also done in your study? If not, what does this indicate in terms of transparency in smart city implementation? Yes, I did not go and verify any of these projects because these are all diffuse projects, money spent in very different areas. So in the usual circuit that I do when I come from Oroville, which is, I live 165 kilometers south of Chennai, 135, sorry. So I am not a Chennaiite, but Chennai is a city that's closest to me and that has interested me because it's quite an incredible opportunity in terms of location, climate, water, and culture. And yet I see it actually degrading and degenerating in front of my eyes in the last 30 years that I've been living near Pondicherry. So that's why I have an interest in it. No, I have not visited these things, but I have looked at different reports and I have been participating in several of the workshops on smart cities and did a study also on the smart city program for Chennai. Yes, the component of between the central government, state government investment into the smart city and the transparency in getting the information between just the financials and actual implementation is very, very obscure. And that is something that needs to change, absolutely needs to change. Otherwise, framing the problem statement that I keep coming back to also becomes more difficult. Uh, Dr. Prakash Dash, he's asked one more question. He was the person who had asked the previous one. Okay. He says that the 55 LPCD pursuance uh, in the Jaljeevan mission and concerns for uh, source sustainability, there is hardly choice, any choice to choose either one. But is it right to critique the effort from builder privatization policy nexus? Or should there be an exploration insistence of Mandatory, uh, mandatory source recharge, uh, restoration, uh, comply, uh, uh, a compliable component while implementing JJM, that is Jal Jeevan mission. Okay. Uh, it, in a way, Dr. Prakash, what you are telling me is exactly what I am saying may not be the right approach. There is a Jal Jeevan program, then it says this is a basic lim a limit that has to be done, and this is supply, but the resource is not there. And there's a conflict between the policy, capability, and actually the willingness to do it. And this you can translate it in, depending on where you stand as an observer. If you're a politician, you can blame one party. If you're a policymaker, you have somebody else to target. If you are actually a citizen, you have another person to target. So in a way, your statement very beautifully illustrates exactly what I have been trying to present. There are efforts from all sides and each side is actually saying, our effort is not coming to fruit 
only because the other sites don't collaborate. Where do we go from here? So I'm asking the question and I am trying to figure out where do we go from here? And Dr. Prakash is asking the same question. So in a way we are all asking the same questions. And even though we may be more enabled than some people to actually have access to information to make, frame our questions with an informed mind, we're still unable to find where is the crux of the problem? And this is a bit alarming. And like Dr. Mani said, a large part of our, I would say, involvement in the development of this country as middle class and even middle class who are educated and enabled is only on two levels. One is to vote and the other one is to protest. There's very little of political participation in terms of change. And I don't blame anybody, I'm part of the problem because the method to participate, it's either you vote me into office or you vote me out of office. Democracy has been reduced to a ballot box. It is not, democracy has not been elevated into building capability. And this is where I would bring in Dr. Amartya Sen's idea of development, which is if you don't build capability for somebody to be enabled to make the right choice, their choice is not a choice. And we are in that state in this country. We are choosing without being enabled to choose from an informed position. And how do we inform ourselves? And that I think has to start not only on the grassroots level with NGOs, but has to start with our administrators and policy makers. I find a huge gap, even within where I live in Oroville, we have an IS officer, but there is a gap between how they operate and their level of awareness in terms of sustainable development, resilience, ecosystem services, and urban planning. There is a huge gap. They are problem solving using old tools for new problems. And that doesn't work anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Swasmi. Uh, uh, Dr. Simi, is there any, are, are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Okay. There are a few questions from uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Nagarajan Krishnamurti ji, okay. uh, where uh, he has asked, why not expand urban areas without destroying the marshlands, lake, ponds, supply channels, canals, etc.? And um, also, many village areas are merged with municipalities and corporations. What happened to the small DT places and sacred groves? Okay. The first thing is when urban areas expand because there's a pressure of population. Now, one of the things you have to understand, and I think most people understand that, Land is an extremely precious resource in this country. I mean, the value of a building on the land is negligible compared to the kind of speculative value of the land. The, the land cost keeps going higher and higher. So as population increases, economic activity uh, increases, you have, a, you have a demand for labor and you have a demand for development. Given the fact that especially a city like Chennai, public transportation, it's poorly developed. Mobility issues, especially the last mile, they're investing a lot in the metros now, right now in Chennai. Last mile is not safe and not accessible. Most people, as soon as they can afford, they want a private motor vehicle. This creates a further demand on terms of land use, in terms of roads and other things. What does it do? The minute you have transportation, you don't want to be in the middle of a bustling city with poor air quality and poor quality of life. So you want to live somewhere else and then you want to work some in the middle of the city. You want to have the, the services and the resources of the city, but not live in the city. So people with cash flow or what we call disposable income constantly move into peri-urban areas. And also one of the advantages of moving into peri-urban areas is the land use. And 
the land regulations, they're not that applied. They're still under panchayats, they're still under town panchayats. So it is more easily modified, more easily. I would almost use the word unlawfully, you know, used for advantage of a few. And so they keep cities keep spilling over into urban area, rural areas that become peri-urban areas which don't have actually the extended services of the municipality, which creates further that the local area gets, you know, its own little microcosm of pollution and water table destruction and everything. No garbage is picked up, so you dump it in low-lying areas. So it's a kind of a vicious cycle that is self-fulfilling. More a city develops, more disposable income, more environmentally fragile, watersheds and food growing rural areas are consumed by peri-urban development. So that's all I can say. I can only describe what's happening, but how do you actually counteract that given the kind of dissonance we have between our political interest, our administrative services, which are still using ideologies, ideas and systems for administration that are 20, 25, 30 years outdated. And the middle class and the people with disposable income feeling more and more that they deserve a better quality of life. They don't wanna live in this chaos. How do you actually bring this dissonance to some kind of standstill first say just with a remote pause? You can't pause things. So it has to be changed while while the destruction is going on. And that I can only think that unless our decision makers are educated again, it's not going to happen. They don't even know there are different ways of doing things. Frankly speaking, most IAS officers that I have interacted with, one in 100 actually is tuned in to know there are different ways. They all use the jargon. Sorry to say it. They use the catchword. They use the jargon. They can talk Sustainability word can be dropped 20 times in one hour. They'll talk about resilience. They'll talk about this. But actually, how does it translate in the way they make decisions? None. They still use the same, same format of structural system for decision making. So I can't say much. We need a change from our policymakers and decision makers. They need to know there's different ways to think before they even know there's different ways to do. Thank you. Um, any yes, other questions, Simi? Uh, Ma'am, if you could just take one more question that is there by uh, Satyajit Dvivedi ji, who asks, um, is it an urban design issue or is it an operations and man maintenance issues? What changes should be made to design city in the master plan with so many greenfield cities coming up? What are some of the recommendations considering the challenges of brownfield maximum cities? I would say that uh, I would not even use the word design. It, that is the old world again. Planners, uh, today urban planning is looking at a much more integrated approach, which is looking at resource, politics, economics, and sociology. We need to start from there. The design of the roads and the buildings, which is what you actually, uh, in a tactile manner, experience while you're an urban dweller is an outcome outcome of policy planning just having the idea that i'm i hear less of it today but i remember 20 years ago we will have city like singapore and kuala lumpur and los angeles our cities will look like that our cities may look like that for one week after inauguration if you pour in capital investment with foreign consultants and foreign technology. But we are the people who are going to live in it. We are not enabled to manage the systems. We are not enabled to choose systems. So just pumping in capital to make a city look like it is Shanghai or Singapore is not going to change the lifestyle and the quality of life of a Chennaiite or somebody living in Delhi. We're still going to throw our garbage in the street. We're still going to have limited water supply. We're still going to have power cuts and air pollution with the kind of transportation system we have. 
So it's not with design, it's with policy planning. And the policy planning has to really take into account economics, sociology, environment, and politics. If these four things don't come together, no amount of throwing money at a problem is going to solve the problem. Actually, throwing money at a problem is going to actually increase the cash flow of a, a section of the society in the city who will then try to find virgin lands to have their plotted development so that they don't have to live in the air quality that they have helped to generate. Sure, absolutely, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Dr. Shyamla, over to you. Okay. Okay, so are there any specific uh, comments that you would like to uh, like summarize or anything like that before I take it up for? Uh, no, ma'am. No, uh, no, I'm no. asking. Uh, to okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Shamila. No, uh, the, okay. the the floor is yours. I would like to have you summarize this okay. because I think it's time we did that, and I want to know about your inputs now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was uh, really wonderful listening to you, uh, Ms. Fahasmi. And uh, yes, uh, you know, as I said, since I'm <laughs> quite familiar with uh, uh, Chennai, some of the things that you have pointed out are absolutely right. This entire thing about this Palikarne um, being made into a landfill, you know, it's something that has been pointed out uh, so many times. And um, also the fact that uh, you know, although Chennai was one of the first cities to start uh, water recharge and water harvesting, um, you know, uh, today you find that the water table may be a little uh, higher, but there are many places where uh, water is sal saline and, uh, you know, the water ingress from the sea has happened. And, uh, you know, uh, even today there is a shortage and they are having to resort to uh, things like desalination uh, program and one of the biggest plants which is there in, in India is in Chennai, uh, near Chennai for water salination uh, from the ocean. And um, uh, like you said, uh, like uh, Dr. Fozia also pointed out, uh, you know, the uh, uh, entire uh, ratio between the built up uh, area and the blue green area has completely reversed um, when uh, I lived in Chennai, I think a lot of people who have lived in Chennai, for us, the mode of transportation was the Palavan Transport Corporation. You know? I mean, I don't remember to have gone to uh, college or school or you know any of my other music class or anything like that, except in a bus. And you know, we used to have uh, printed the timetable and the bus would arrive right at the right time, you know, and uh, one could, uh, you know, literally play it by the clock. And uh, there used to be even, uh, you know, even at that time, lady special and the various, uh, you know, reservations of seats and the, quite a lot of discipline. And the conductor was like, a, you know, a real uh, uh, organizer. So, but today, you know, uh, I was telling uh, somebody in the place where I used to live in uh, Chennai, uh, it was very common for uh, our family member to say that, you know, um, walk a kilometer and a half and can you get the provisions at this particular thing that is required for the house. But today that, uh, you know, the redevelopment of the city has made uh, that one and a half kilometers inaccessible. You cannot send a child out to buy anything, either in a cycle or by walking because the roads are just full of traffic and it is high speed traffic. And uh, so actually distances have become more, although it looks like as if the roads have become uh, bigger or better or, uh, you know, the um, mobility has increased, but actually it has uh, done the exact opposite. It has become inaccessible for many people who do not have any access to, uh, you know, automobiles or, uh, you know, three wheelers or four, four wheelers, any of these. So, uh, uh, I mean, you know, the, uh, you can say the unplanned uh, development of many of our cities is uh, reflected in uh, uh, Chennai also. And of course, the uh, reduction in greenery. I mean, uh, um, it was very common for us to go to uh, school walking, just going under the trees. You know, it was even a kilometer, two kilometers didn't make any difference because that was what it was. You know, it was just full of banyan trees. And today you find that, uh, you know, the urban heat island effect 
uh, uh, even in cities like uh, Chennai and um, you know from PHFI there have been several studies which are still going on uh, where it uh, shows that uh, maybe very close to the ocean and the seashore uh, the temperatures are a little uh, uh, you know better and also the air quality is a little uh, somewhat uh, better. But as you go a little inland, uh, you know, towards uh, the industrial area and all that, both the heat island effect is also very high and also the air quality uh, reduces uh, tremendously, as does the you know, water situation. Like rightly you pointed out, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, food uh, comes from uh, very, very far. Uh, I have visited the Coimbedo market uh, several times and I uh, also visited when the um, uh, captive uh, biomethanation plant was set up, you know, for 60 uh, TPD, right next to the, uh, the Coimbeda market for the waste management, you know, all the vegetable waste. And that was among the first uh, biomethanation plant that was set up uh, with uh, Swiss uh, participation. But unfortunately, uh, you know, it has undergone a lot of uh, issues and problems, and I'm not very sure whether it is uh, uh, functional just now, because it was uh, really feeding, uh, you know, gas and electricity into the grid, and uh, people were uh, using it, and it was being used for even lighting the marketplace itself. But today, I don't know what the current situation is. Actually, the technology for biomethanation has improved. In fact, uh, uh, you know, the indoor biomethanation uh, plant, which is now running the entire city uh, fleet, city bus fleet uh, in indoor, they did their entire experiment uh, in uh, Chennai, Chengalpet, you know, where they have their SEZ, uh, Mahindra's did that. And today they have uh, huge uh, uh, contracts, not only in indoor, but in several other cities in the country. But how uh, Chennai itself has not been able to use uh, uh, some of these technologies is, uh, is like you said, you know, is a really a question mark. And um, as you rightly said, Perengudi and various other coding value, all those places, uh, you know, it's just uh, going into the uh, landfill and that way we are losing a lot of uh, land. And like you said, uh, the nutrient instead of going back to the uh, rural areas for agriculture or for uh, food production, is actually uh, just landing in dumpful sites and probably just leading to fungal spores, you know, now that mm, of course. You know, because of mm. that is a matter of discussion. Um, but uh, I would just like to point out, since I am living in Delhi, uh, that that thing about Yamuna floodplain that you pointed out, today that is not considered because as a good alternative, the reason being that Yamuna has got polluted. Of course, the yes. Yamuna floodplains mm. have got polluted so much so, that the um, Dharamshala Cancer Hospital, uh, very close to the, those places, they have done a study and they are saying that uh, at least uh, you know, there is a very strong association between those uh, who are actually consuming uh, many of the vegetables and fruits and all that, and the increase in cancer cases, especially in uh, children, uh, you know, childhood cancers uh, going up and things like that. And just now there is a huge debate between whether those farmers need to be relocated and uh, you know and yamuna according to the entire uh, sewage treatment plant uh, plan that we have because like as you rightly pointed out uh, just like in chennai in delhi also the lal dora lands you know which are basically um, uh, uh, you know villages which have got swallowed up in the urban uh, planning but at the same time don't have the same rules and regulations that apply to other places. All those places are also putting their pollutants and many other industrial areas, it may be Okla or uh, Vazirpur or any of these places which are supposed to do uh, effluent treatment plant, they are not doing and all those chemicals are also, and you know, uh, my PhD student and I did on Okla landfill, which is very close mm -hmm. to the Yamuna, very close to the canal. And we found, uh, you know, up to five kilometer radius uh, of that plant, the heavy metals and uh, persistent organic pollutants and several other things are uh, going into the groundwater as well as it is going into the Yamuna as well. So, um, I mean, these kind of problems that you have pointed out, the, you know, the uh, Palikarni must have absolutely contaminated groundwater in those areas. And the fact that 
urbanization as it increases, you know, it uh, sort of swallows up a lot of land and it goes into per peri-urban areas. The entire 2015 flood uh, woes and, you know, the number of people who died standing on dining tables and, you know, like such horror stories that one heard about uh, was, uh, you know, because uh, somebody did not say no. I mean, uh, you know, it is not only the climate change part of it, it is also it is true that the rainfall was uh, much beyond uh, what the Red Hills could have held or emptied mm -hmm. even five times. Uh, the, the, the rainfall was very, very intense. And it was, uh, they said, once in a hundred year rain. But uh, as climate change is progressing, we are going to have these once in hundred year events as once in uh, 20 year events, once in 10 year events, maybe even every alternate year. Like you said, 2015 and then followed by 2019, which was also mm. pretty bad. So, uh, you know, one has to uh, begin to uh, think about, uh, not the, as you rightly pointed out, the policy makers and how they are really approaching uh, problems just as a firefighting. That's what I think you were trying to say. That Absolutely. The old yeah. approach, you know, it is not an approach of, um, uh, you know, um, I have to think completely anew. And um, this is uh, something that, um, you know, Dr. Fozia also mentioned about the uh, Gurgaon uh, experiments and all that. I have also been um, uh, sort of uh, advising and uh, trying to help some of the Gurgaon uh, residents, uh, you know, as far as waste management and some of these uh, water walls. And uh, one of the things, uh, you know, simultaneously, I have been trying to find in uh, Delhi also, I'm, uh, you know, that uh, there are two things which I would like to point out. One may be that, yes, the, um, uh, you know, the uh, administrative uh, approach has to be different. But in, uh, uh, in Delhi, yet another thing which I found out was that um, there is uh, corruption is the bane of this country. And we cannot Absolutely. deny it. And, uh, you know, I have uh, been speaking to fairly senior officers at the engineer and the you know technical technical level and also the uh, bureaucratic level and uh, you know this entire cut business you know for instance uh, uh, to, to take a very simple thing about the solid waste uh, management um, uh, today uh, gurgaon and uh, delhi and several other cities in the country including chennai are um, are uh, suffering because of this entire uh, this uh, concessional document, this contractual mechanism, where uh, you know, uh, despite the solid waste management rules saying that you have to segregate at source, you have to do a maximum amount of composting, biomethanation locally, and uh, even dry waste has to be, if possible, sold off locally, and only the domestic hazardous waste, sanitary waste, need to go out of the community, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Swachh Bharat Mission, I think, you know, under NIUA, we did something like 154 workshops with some 6,000 ULB participants, so ULB officials, you know, we trained and all that. But the fact is that in the rules, they have not said categorically that mixed waste processing will not be allowed. They have not said it. And unfortunately, uh, this is the loophole that is being used by uh, you know, commissioners and deputy commissioners of uh, various municipal corporations, municipalities, and even uh, small, small urban uh, local bodies uh, who are uh, giving this kind of collection and transportation and dumping concessional document, which is a tipping fee. Basically, you, you don't yeah. care whether it's, and you know, if you give something like 1700 rupees per ton or 1800 rupees per ton, no collection and transportation person is ever going to uh, take segregated that waste. You may, uh, you know, um, uh, you, you may keep repeating it till the cows come home, but you are not going to get this done unless, uh, you know, you put it very, very categorically and you say under EPA Act, you will be punished or you will be uh, incarcerated or something like that. Because uh, today, all, most of the cities, except uh, some uh, cities like uh, Bengaluru, Pune, and indoor because of its slightly centralized systems or, you know, Ambikapur or some place like that. Most of the cities are continuing with this. And, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, if I, if, when I talk to the uh, senior people, they say that it is basically most of these contractors are attached to a politician. The politician doesn't want the system to go. 
and uh, we don't know how much of nexus there is or there is none. I mean, I cannot say this because it's very difficult to establish. But uh, you know, the, the the either the bureaucrat just uh, uh, turns a blind eye and does not do anything about it, or he or she sticks out her neck or his neck and gets chopped off. You know, next time you will find that that person is transferred out of that uh, you know corporation and he or she is somewhere put in some big place you know where it won't matter you know whether she's honest or not we have had cases uh, you know recently where a uh, honest uh, uh, you know um, you know uh, a technical person was actually killed because he refused to take bribe yeah it was in the newspaper i mean it has happened uh, so these kind of things so there are also people who fear for their life because you know if somebody is going to take that kind of an action it's uh, i'm not trying to justify i'm not trying to of course you just say yeah Mm. Of course, obviously, it has to be addressed. And so I personally feel that some of the things that you said that about the middle class, you see what has happened is uh, this entire, if, if you take an example of water, it has become a commodity. It used to be a resource. It has now become a commodity. If you say that, okay, uh, you know, uh, Chennai, uh, you know, let us say in the British times, uh, you know, the water had to come from the Adyar River or the Red Hills or the Kuam or, uh, you know, the recharge or whatever it is. Then, you know, the, the person who's living there feels that I have to do something. Otherwise, you know, we had in, in the house where I lived in, I did a live store, Dr. Radha Kishansale, we had a well in our house. And uh, we used to use that well. And uh, it was uh, quite a thing, you know, to maintain that well, clean it. It used to be one biannual thing. And there used to be a person who used to come and clean it. And we have to maintain because the level of water was very, very important for us. And the water over tank used to go from there. But then, you know, once the water became a commodity and, you know, uh, you could bring water from Krishna, you could bring water from wherever you want. You can bring it from underground. You can start extracting. And all you need to do is to sit back and pay for it. You yeah, know, of course, then when there's no the responsibility. between the, the people and the resource is lost. The same with the food, same with, I would say, various other uh, resources. And I think, and the middle class now, uh, you know, it has been reduced to a ballot box, like you rightly pointed out, is because, you know, uh, we, uh, we, uh, there was such a disconnect between what we are responsible for and what is really, uh, you know, possible for us to uh, do, is that I find today, that when we are talking about even solid waste management rules, many of the middle class who are affected by it, who, whose children cannot breathe, who are having asthma, who are uh, against that, uh, you know, a waste to energy plant coming and spewing, uh, you know, all sorts of toxins at them. And they are actually being affected. But they have not read the rules of the country. Mm. They are talking in terms of, you know, some other organization, which is, I'm not saying you should not participate in international uh, campaigns. You should. You should know what is happening internationally, what is being said, what is the technology. You should. But you should know your country's own laws. And you should know how to represent that to the bureaucrat or to the politician or to make a group effective enough. Because that is very, very important. And unfortunately, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, lacking. And that is the reason why uh, many groups, NGOs, even uh, communities, community-based organizations are getting branded as, uh, I don't want to use the particular yeah. word, but you know what I'm talking mm. about. You know, they get branded as uh, uh, not the right people to follow. So this is something that, you know, we have to regain this, uh, 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 this you know, the ability, the capacity to discuss with our elected representatives and they, you know, why a lawyer makes so much of money or makes such an impact? Because mm. he or she knows not just the laws of the land. They know the precedence. They know how to represent it. They know how to, what is to, you know, what is it that you have to go and fight for? How do you really word your uh, sentence or represent the person whom you are fighting for? But the, uh, you know, the NGOs, the CBOs, the middle class, the people who matter, who can actually, I, I feel, this is my personal opinion, 
that we are not doing adequately to understand, uh, you know, what is it that we have been uh, given and what is it that we should ask for and how we should represent and, uh, you know, so this is my brief, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of take on this. And, um, but I think some of the questions were also extremely good. And um, uh, as, as, uh, as Suhasini Ji and Dr. Fozia, everybody has pointed out that, uh, you know, we need um, uh, much more decentralization, participation, uh, much greater, uh, you know, also, I totally agree that, uh, you know, whether it's the bureaucracy, whether it is the political system, they need to be informed that these kind of piecemeal, uh, you know, band-aids here and there uh, is not going to work, especially uh, with climate change <laughs> right on top Absolutely, of absolutely. So yeah. I think... Um, uh, this is what I would like to say. Thank you very much uh, to Suhasini Ji, to Dr. Fozia, uh, Dr. Arjun Simi, and um, also um, uh, other members of IMPRI. And uh, if there's anybody else who wants to make some final housekeeping announcements. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. If we could just uh, hear from Suhasini ma'am as concluding remarks for a minute. And then we can go on to okay. the so I've, I would uh, say that the extent and the depth of how Dr. Mani illustrated various issues to bring out the disconnect between we as consumers and we as the actors who actually create the problem. I think it is very, very interesting as an introspective aspect of it. And not being informed enough to be actually effective participants in our own development makes us a major part of the problem of what we are facing today. And that is what I would like to say that maybe we as citizens carry the major part of the responsibility of the urban deterioration that we are all living in. And we try our best to distance ourselves from it by either land use planning or by treating resources as a commodity and uh, having enough, you know, what you would call income to pay for it. But at the end of the day, citizens and especially enabled and enlightened citizens not participating puts the burden on the people in the lower end of the economic strata where they don't have a voice and lets the people who hold the power, the power can be political or economic to exploit. So in a way we become a bit, not just the bridge, but the enabler of this system that does not work. And the policy planning will be a reflection of the people who actually enable the policy, and that's us. Urban dwellers, the middle class, empowered, informed, are actually the basis of the policy planners, and we need to speak up, and to speak up, we need to get informed. And that's why I would like to thank IMPRI, because programs like this and webinars like this are an excellent medium of information you know, even among ourselves, you know, each of us come from very different areas of work and to be able to talk together as mutual information and awareness extends our horizons way beyond than what we know, you know. Thank you to Impri and Dr. Arjun Kumar, Simi and others. Thank you so much. And Dr. Mani, especially thanks to you. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. It was indeed a very, very enriching, intellectually rich, in fact, a theoretically and practically grounded and also very passionate deliberation. And we learned a lot from you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So I would like to invite uh, Ms. Anshula Mehta, Senior Assistant Director of IMPRI, to propose the formal vote of thanks. Anshula, over to you. So formally, on behalf of the IMPRI Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today for this web policy talk. We are grateful to Ms. Sohasini Ayer, our speaker for today, for taking up the time to deliver this very engaging talk and 
giving rise to such a public discussion on urban water, food and waste cycling, and socioeconomic equity. We are grateful to Professor Shamla Manina for joining us today as the chair for this session and for adding her insights to the deliberation. And to our discussant, Dr. Fozia Taranu, for joining us and sharing her perspectives. We are grateful to all the participants who joined us here on Zoom or on Facebook Live or even if you will be watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on the podcast. Thank you for joining us and for raising such pertinent questions. And we hope that we continue to tune in to future episodes of City Conversations. And I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Yeah. Have a nice evening. Nice yeah. evening. Thanks.